Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to The Nest. It's June 18th, 2020, and we are streaming live with participants from Africa, Europe, and North America. For those of you joining for the first time, I am Jim Chu in San Francisco, California, and the goal here on The Nest is to connect entrepreneurs in frontier markets with angel investors worldwide. We stream every Thursday and all episodes are recorded and available on our website, findthenest.org. Today, we'll be hearing pitches from two companies, both from South Africa. They will be pitching to three angels, all of whom are based in beautiful Cape Town. Will Green and Hannah Subai are joining us for the first time, and Zachariah George returns for another round. We'll hear all about them in a second, but before that, I have a few important announcements. First of all, I'm thrilled to announce that The Nest is going even more global. We will be partnering with local groups and angel networks from around the world in our future sessions. Next week on June 25th, we will start with our world tour in Nairobi in partnership with Nairobi Garage. And we will feature companies from East Africa. Then on July 2nd, we travel to Singapore where we'll host a session in partnership with the Living Labs Federation to focus for the first time on companies in Southeast Asia. Thanks to Jan Lemuel for making that happen. Then the week after that, on July 9th, Jorian Wilkins from the Opportunity Collaboration will be our guest moderator for a joint session with, of course, the Opportunity Collaboration. We then venture back to Bangladesh on July 16th when we host a joint session in partnership with the Bangladesh Angels Network. So all that travel is making me excited and it's actually a good reminder to launch our first poll as well. Where is everyone from? Can we get that poll up, please? For those of you in the audience, we want to hear from you. This is an interactive forum. And so we've purposely left it open for questions and comments from everyone and anyone. So use that chat box, make comments and ask questions during the show. And if you like, you can even make some investments. Um, in the meantime, use that chat box to introduce yourself, tell us who you are, what you do, which country you're from, and why you're here on the show. Uh, all right, let's get going. Oops. So first of all, a quick introduction of myself. My name is Jim Chu, and I'm based here in San Francisco. I invest in startups around the world, both personally as well as through Untapped, our company. And our mission at Untapped is to support entrepreneurs and innovation in frontier markets through investment and technology. So if you're interested in investing in frontier markets, let me know. I'm at jim at untappedinc.com, and you'll also find me on LinkedIn. All right, now over to the angels. So uh, Will, would you like to start first with introductions? Sure. Yeah, my name's Will Green. I'm a program director at, at Grindstone, which is a, basically a scale-up uh, growth program accelerator based in Cape Town. And uh, yeah, um, I'm also an, a startup advisor and an investor myself. Great. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Hannah? Good evening, everyone. My name is Hannah. Uh, I'm Congolese DRC based in Cape Town. I am a principal in one of the largest uh, Pan-African fund of funds, uh, managing close to $1 billion. In the past few years, I have started to uh, enjoy investing as well uh, through an investment club and also in my own personal capacity. I have a specific expertise and preference for uh, tech businesses, especially when they are run by women. Thank you very much. Jean Paul's invitation. And Zach, tell us about yourself. Thank you, Jim, and good to be back. Uh, folks, um, I am the co-founder and chief investment officer of Startup Bootcamp Africa, one of the largest accelerators for early stage technology ventures in Africa. I'm also a very active angel investor on African focused technologies. Um, and I've just launched Africa's first um, pan-continental seed venture capital fund called Launch Africa. Uh, and I'm glad to, uh, to be on the nest again. And Jim's one of our, uh, one of the investors in Launch Africa. And I'm excited to see a couple of good ventures today. Yeah, great. And hopefully uh, through the nest, we'll, we'll identify some, some more opportunities for Launch Africa. 
Thank you, Jim. Wonderful. And, and did I understand it correctly that all three of you are um, in Cape Town? How small is Cape Town? Do you, Indeed. <laughs> the best city on right. earth. Do, do you guys all get together, have beers, and talk smack about startups when you're around? No, but we will now. <laughs> we will now. And, and, and an interesting piece of trivia for everyone listening around the world is uh, there's a town about half an hour um, northeast of Cape Town called Stellenbosch, which is wine country. Mm. And Stellenbosch is the wealthiest town in the world per capita. Mm. So what you're favorite? saying is that the next nest focused on South Africa needs to be in Stellenbosch. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, thanks for that. So do we do we have um, results from the poll? Thank you. So it looks like we have a very strong Africa showing and um, a number number of people from North America as well. So let's move on to the presenters. So we'll hand it over to you now uh, from Wifike and uh, with Quilly. And then we'll go over to you, Tahir, in a minute. Thank you right. so much. And, uh, okay. Feel free to share your screen. Yeah, let me know when everyone can see that. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. I'll start. So there's two reasons why we got into Quilly. The first one is that what bothered us was that the levels of prosperity on the continent were low. We felt that we will remain low so long as Africa doesn't begin to industrialize and start moving up the value chain. The second thing that bothered us is that although we're in the fourth industrial revolution, Africans have got no real means of participating. In it. You put a cocktail of measures together, you'll find that we rank the lowest in a lot of them. So when we started building, building a company, we said the first thing we wanted to do is build a company that would otherwise somehow move industrialization, help industrialization of the company. But the second solution was Queen. So to introduce us, I'm Tanwe. I worked for Duracell for four and a half years. I ran the SADC business. I helped develop market entry strategies and also manage the in-market sales in each of those countries. My co-founder, Liolo, worked for a Beijing-based management consulting firm where he helped, build, helped multinationals build their supply chains out of Asia and also helped them develop their market entry strategies into Asia. Tapuma works for a legal insurance firm where he runs a team that builds their digital platform and he's also had some hardware engineering experience at a previous startup. We started this company last year in June and Viola and I are full-time in it. So the problem in the continent is that the unique mobile subscriber number is the lowest in the world at 44%. But of that 44%, only 40% own smartphones. And the reason why is actually firstly is understand Africans don't know how to use a smartphone and they don't understand the benefits of using those smartphones. So much so that people who do own smartphones tend to only use the functions that are already available on a feature. The second issue is affordability, where Africans can expect to pay up to four times their monthly salary just to acquire a, a smartphone. And lastly, there's a perception amongst Africans that locally relevant content is not available on smartphones. So when we map the opportunity, we, in six countries, we found that there were currently just under 120 million active uh, future phone users. We want to convert 25% of those users over a period of five years, and that results in 96 million phones being sold. But the true value of this hardware is not in the hardware sales, it's actually in the transactions you enable. We estimate that to be $1.2 billion per month. This is what we're trying to our business model is to take users through a once-off voice prompt tutorial, showing them not only how to use a smartphone, but the benefits of using a smartphone. The second thing is to lost leave the phone and retail it at $11 and use some of those other transactions that I just mentioned to make the phone profit. And lastly, let's just show them locally relevant content on the smartphone. So when we built our first smartphone, we wanted to position our phone versus competition like this. Firstly, users needed to understand that they were getting an $11 smartphone that was otherwise actually valued at $50. The second impression we wanted them to have is that their user experience needed to be significantly better than even some of the best smartphones out there. And when I talk about this consumer, I'm typically talking about consumers who live in urban or peri-urban areas and are active feature phone users. Our go-to-market strategy is for Kodi to only focus on brand building, software development, and product development. Will outsource all other functions 
such as uh, contract manufacturing and using full service distributors to help us gain distribution into the market. To date, we've sold 40 phones. And although 40 phones were available, we actually had demand from just under 300 people for the phone. Users of our phones showed significantly higher data usage, and they also showed a stronger interaction with the phone. And lastly, we had a 72% adoption rate for a unknown music platform to our users. So our revenue model is actually to display poster ads on the home screen of the phone, to make a commission on the data and airtime sold on the phone and have an exclusivity agreement with a telco, and lastly, to charge companies that want to feature on our, uh, on our video tutorial. But some of the other revenue streams that we would notice is that we could actually package a couple of the premium services and match that to a user's interest and make a margin on, the, on those subscriptions. You can also make a percentage on the mobile money that tapped uh, transactions that happen on our phone. And lastly, sell uh, user data to third parties such as Nielsen. So our current round is for $150,000, but our ask from Nest is $50,000. We're raising that in saves at a valuation cap of $3 million, and we'll use that money to do further hardware development, software development, and distribute and, and make a thousand for Thank you. Great, great timing, just in time. Thank you very much. All right, over to the angels for comments, questions. And again, uh, audience members, please feel free to ask questions and make comments via the chat box. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the hardware um, part of your business? Uh, you mentioned you have outsourced. Uh, do you use a local manufacturer uh, for the hardware, the chip? Do you import from China or India as, as typically? And in this case, um, how is your business impacted by COVID and the potential border closure? Right, so I'll answer the first question. The hardware comes from China. Uh, our, co our CEO and co-founder, Liolo, actually has been talking to a couple of manufacturers that already have a presence on the continent. I won't mention some of the brands they work with already, but they tend to know the regulatory environment already. We have a clear understanding of what their production capacity is. Uh, we're doing a, a couple more vetting of the supply that we want to meet down to two, and those are in China and Shenzhen. Um, how our business actually has affected us is firstly, there's actually a massive uh, overcapacity at the moment in smartphones. So I did say our cost of the units at the moment is $30 per unit, but we think that we might be able to get it a lot lower and that's artificially been made because of COVID. Um, also the other thing that we're noticing is that we feel that there's a greater need now for our own people to start going digital. Lockdowns have been horrible and people, people are bored. They want to understand what else is out there. Um, that's available on digital platforms. Some of them have, try, have tried uh, digital platforms and are loved it, and they realize that uh, this is something that they might want. So a, we feel that there's a great initiative. How do you deal with the issue of having a cost-based partially in dollars while your revenues are generated in local African currencies uh, in Iran? And how do you deal with currency volatility and depreciation? Unfortunately, it comes down to pricing. So the, the and it, from my time from Jurassic, this was the same thing. Whenever there was uh, currency volatility, we had to just price. And it's the same thing that will happen with us. Um, but further to what you're saying is that, like we said, in our long-term vision is to move the means of production here. There's no reason why once you have scale of 96 million units that you shouldn't have production assembly plants on the continent to actually protect you from FX volatility, especially when you start talking about markets such as Nigeria and uh, or we, you know, name the West African country, we have a lot of uh, currency volatility. Um, and that's why we, our long-term vision within the, you know, is to build manufacturing capacity. Uh, it makes sense from a, a business perspective to protect us against FX because of the nature of our revenue streams and also because of what others Thank you. What does Quilly stand for? Just as a. 
So we so Kuli, it's actually a click in the local class is our name. Um, but we knew that everyone would call it Kuli, it still sounds cool. So Kuli is actually a mountain peak. And if you wanna, you know, the story behind Kuli was that like we said, like, you know, as a people we wanted to reach some reach some sort of peak. And that's Kuli, the Kasa. However, Kuli is also a medicinal herb in the village where we ran these tracks, the village of Kuilane. Um, and we, the spin that we have on the name is that we think that the medicinal herb, otherwise the ailment of not being able to use a smartphone is this phone. So it represents a, a, a solution to, to not, not understanding how to use smartphones when they benefit. Cool. Yes. Yeah, so, um... Tandwe, just a couple of questions from my side. So I've, uh, I saw a similar company about six years ago called Dream Mobile. Not sure if, if you're familiar with them, but they tried to do something similar. And back then they tried to do a $40 smartphone to the market. Um, could you just quickly go back to your revenue stream slide quick? I have a couple of questions on that. Um, sort of the, the different revenue streams, sorry. Uh, yeah, that one, yeah, right there, perfect. So you're saying it costs $30 for a phone, right? That's all inclusive, right? That's fixed and variable. Right. All inclusive. Right. Okay. And you're selling it for $10 and you're saying the, the customer, what makes your model special is it's the, um, the service providers that are subsidizing the cost of customers paying for data usage from what I understand. Is that, am I right in saying that? No, so it's, yes, it's the cost of selling the hardware at a loss, but what actually makes us revenue is the displaying of ads. So they're almost like think of AdSense or Facebook ads displaying on your phone. The second one is that if you think of people like Flash Mobile and yep. um, uh, Blue Label, Label Telecom, yeah, correct. They they own a margin in all the data and airtime that's sold, um, yep. and they do that typically through brick and mortar distribution. We're doing yep. that on our own, and we're saying that we'll partner with a telco to uh, to do something like this. So typically, the margins are five percent, but yep. we, we believe that we can get it a lot higher. Um, and the reason why we believe that is because we see our stuff. So I don't know how I think I have many of Dream Mobile, but we almost see ourselves as an arm to a telco. And the reason being is mainly because telcos are moving, pivoting their business models away from just selling data and airtime and moving further into uh, getting users onto their video platforms, et cetera. So we feel that we have a strong case to actually um, yeah, so have a higher. Yeah, Hannah, so, so, Hannah, oh, Will, yeah, go ahead. I was you. just gonna jump in really quickly because um, there's a question or there's a comment from the audience that related to what you're just saying, John Fugay which is, um, and let me just read what he wrote. Uh, Quilly's business model is very innovative. We think it could be scaled as a discount coupon to other brands of phones. So basically really enabling their, so other brands of phones or telcos to sell more of their, uh, of their services and their products. Um, what, what do you think of that comment? No, I, I, my, my comment was more on the, on the advertising side, which is my sort of background. And, and just to understand, you know, have you have you had any sort of understanding of your sort of cost per per milli the CPM that you could get um, because obviously you, you're up against some some quite um, established sort of ad uh, giants if you think of ten dollars every eight dollars goes to either Google or Facebook so yeah I was just wondering if you had obviously looked at at your your uh, mobile ad uh, video ads and and seen any sort of interest from from big advertisers or possibly a, a telco that, that you look at you know, partnering with? So just to, one thing is, this is a lifetime value of a phone. So really you notice that there's, a, there's actually a payback period, Perfect. which is 16 Perfect. months in the first year, and then it goes, that, so that's the first, so that's $10 over the lifetime. Um, we, when we did all of these revenue streams, we tested all of these revenue streams. So the first thing that we want to do is, we don't want to go and compete, we actually want to go and there's an API that you can load into the phone. Sorry? Actually have the fun. Someone asking a question? Oh. No. There's an API you can load on, you can, that you can load onto the phone and actually have ads running in the background. So it's actually Facebook or AdSense ads. You're not competing with them. You're just 
and okay. um, typically you do you're anyway. basically taking the publisher code and you you're publishing it through onto your onto the home screen correct yes uh, just to answer that question uh, have I missed the question sorry uh, no, that's cool so uh, bouncing back on this topic, so what are the partnerships and commercial partnerships that you have uh, secured um, on the back of your pilot? Have you signed an MNO, like an MTN? Uh, I've seen some presentations around where a few companies were kind of mentioned. So have you signed anything as of today? So we, it's very easy to get a, a, to be a data reseller ready. Uh, we have one with Flash and there's another company um, so the name escapes me, but the, the flash was the best one. So, but signing an, an MNO, and o you, you almost need to or MBO, you, know, you, you actually need to almost prove to them that you, you have the type yeah. of scale and the ability to go and do this on a big scale or else they'll just give you the standard 5%. They have platforms where you could literally just integrate it into your phone, line of code, and you can start signing data tomorrow. That's not what we want to do. We, we, we want to be a lot bigger than that. We want to show them that we have actually um, an arm for them. We say, listen, we're going to introduce people to your platforms. We have these video controls in the work. Therefore, how we pay ourselves is that we need a bigger portion of the revenue. Um, to answer your question on some other things, that, but so we haven't, we've been trying to get meetings with, um, with the likes of MTN and Salsi. We are, we have, we are in talks with Salsi. They wanted us to do an MVNO, uh, mm -hmm. but we are exploring all other options as well. We, we've in talks with two other companies to run uh, video tutorials on our phones just for these thousand phones. Uh, they've expressed interest in them. Uh, so, and, and they've seen that it can work and it makes sense for their market as well. Uh, yes. Can I, can I could I just ask you something on so, so so the one part of your presentation that I that that actually got me interested was the uh, the data on Spotify and YouTube and other services. Are those actual conversations you've had with Spotify, YouTube, and Showmax? Let me just finish no. the question quick. Um, and because my thoughts on that were because you're a low cost smartphone you don't want to go with those providers and rather go with an alternative music streaming service that could be a native app on your phone versus going with the regular players or go with a local video streaming platform or local movies and, and there are plenty in Africa that would love to be a native app and have them pay for it versus go to these, these three big boys here. I mean, why so, not go the native route? We, we'd love to. This was more of an example of what ought, that, what we, what ought to be. Um, the, you're right about saying that the big players, it's hard to get meetings. Actually, some of my soft ass is intros to people who might know these, but I'm definitely interested in pushing, uh, you know, more locally uh, viable uh, partners such as Boomplay in Nigeria, for instance. Um, so I don't disagree with you all at all. Okay. Yeah, question. Yeah, so yeah. Oh, sorry. We're not in talks with anyone. Okay. Just, just a question regarding the distribution model, because uh, you are clearly targeting people who currently have a feature phone. So I would suspect in South Africa, it's more like poor people, townships. Uh, it's a bit of a cliche, but I suspect then you need to distribute your phone through spaza shops, and like it's super complicated. Like, how, how do you expect? A business to reach a scalable level very quickly. All right. Full service distributors is my answer to that. There's a collection of distributors that pr distribute Procter and Gamble products, and you know, from my old days at Duracell, who have a massive amount of scale um, in okay. some of these. To give you an example, there's one distributor in Nigeria that actually co-owns up to 400 other distributors trying to deal with the problem you're exactly talking about. As opposed to trying to build a local sales force on the ground, I'd rather leverage them as an agent and give them a fee. Part of our revenue, actually the hardware, you would have seen that the revenue is $5 per phone. That's actually net revenue after having paid the distributor his fee. All right, this was my next question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So what are the payment options that are given to those customers? Are the customers expected to pay cash given that the price is very low or do you contemplate, you know, monthly payment or? Cash, the, the whole idea of this model was to have a no strings attached model for it. If a user, if a consumer on the continent wants to buy a phone, they need to walk into a store and go buy the phone for $11 cash and then they might they'll go home with their phone. That's where the conversation with them ends. Then that's when everything else and all our uh, revenue models kicking in, everything from the ads to selling them premium subscriptions to showing them how to use the phone and also um, the benefits and some of marrying some of the interests to some of the platforms that are available for them. Yeah, just one, one, uh, one last question here. I've worked quite a bit with Ross Norton who runs Flash in South Africa and then the Blue Label guys. It is, it is, it is quite a very tough monopoly to get into and they're very protective of their turf. And they're yeah. constantly battling with the m and So you're saying, just help me here, are you going to bypass the distributors and go straight to the m and Or are you no. going to work with Flash and... and, no. and Working yeah. with Flash, firstly, they take an incredible amount of margin. I'm um, aware, yeah. And you're right, they are very, very territorial. Yes. There's no point in talking to them. I mean, some of our first trials using their platform were an absolute disaster. So yeah. to be put it frankly, I, you want to go straight to the MNOs. We are talking to another um, angel who's trying to get us a meeting with Vodacom and MTN to, to bypass them. With COVID, they've been really busy. But we, I don't want to work with uh, resellers. I want to work with the MNOs. Yeah. Of course, of course. You just mentioned earlier that you were working with Flash, so I would, but that wasn't for distribution, that was for something else. No, 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 no. So Fla Flash already has a platform where you can literally just download it and be a reseller for Flash. And it's, okay. it's online. Like it's, you know, yeah, for instance, yeah, yeah. a user will text you and say, hey, can I buy 12 Rand? Um, it was really bootstrap. Like, can I buy 12 Rand airtime? Yes, you can. Uh, Give me the 12 rand and here it, it's very, that, that's how you do it in yeah. Flash. And there are ways to integrate into your phone and everything, but I'd rather, yeah. Okay. I'll, um, I'll, I'll definitely be able to help you with introductions to, to MTN as well as potentially Vodacom. Three quick last comments and questions on my side. Um, just regarding the competition, I think you should try to expand a little bit more your competitive landscape um, because I think you compared your phone to uh, existing, you know, like kind of established businesses. Uh, but I personally know three more uh, African ventures that are trying to do exactly what you're doing right now, uh, okay. including you've heard of them but, but Kumfabu in Guinea and Solo in Nigeria and um, Mara uh, which is backed by a massive East African conglomerate and that is uh, coming big into South Africa so I think if you want to um, make sure that um, investors are convinced by the uniqueness of your opportunity you should compare yourself to those guys instead of uh, some of the um, you have mentioned here um, then second question then, uh, is there any way for you to have a patent or do you have any IP related to that product now in the future or it's uh, more like a sort of uh, marketing game when it comes to your phone? The IP will predominantly be in the software, the educational software that our CTO of Fuma is building. Um, there wasn't really a need for um, mobile or the hardware patent for now and the reason why was that um, the amount of time and logistics and cost in doing that wasn't necessary. The immediate problem is, can we sell a phone and loss feed it and make money in the long run? So we've put hardware design, well, we are, have been designing and doing iterations with our partners in China, um, but, there hasn't been a, but there hasn't been a need to go and say, we're going to patent that just yet. Um, but definitely within the short run, we will be, start doing stuff like that. But the immediate IP is really the software. Fantastic. And uh, the last com comment question. Uh, definitely, I agree. You should uh, try to think a bit more about local apps who would be keen on, you know, paying you to be on your phone because they are targeting this type of customers. And also, like, I can happily make some introductions because I know uh, some startups would be uh, definitely interested in your, uh, in your uh, venture. 
So just make sure, I think, uh, that you do your DD on your potential investors because clearly uh, funding is not the only thing that you need. You need access to, you know, like businesses and a lot of uh, strategic kind of input. So just make sure that you don't go uh, just for the easy money. Yeah, yeah, of this is just, just one question I wanted to ask. Sorry, I think William, maybe you unmute if you ask me a question. But I'm just going to quickly jump in here. I'm not on mute. Um, <laughs> oh, okay, cool. Um, Tanway, what happens with regards to maintenance and repair? You're getting these phones from China. Uh, I mean, it's 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 a cheap smartphone. So, is there any maintenance repair servicing option, or is it pretty much this is a ten dollar phone? If it if if the software tanks too bad, well, what's what's your maintenance and repair strategy so, plan? So we have two lines of defense. The first thing that we noticed with those first batches of phones is that phones break and people break them. We need to make them as durable as possible. We're not giving the option to use well. You have a screen protector and a cover. That's the first thing. But the second thing that we've been exploring is actually partnering with the likes of like Refix to provide the parts for them at no cost, to say to them that your standard repair fee needs to be uh, a fraction of the cost that that user would have bought that phone for. And yeah. it, it makes you lose a little bit of money on that. And the reason why is because of our business model. We heavily incentivize making sure that our phones last for three years as opposed to just two years. Um, we, we haven't, we haven't started, you know, for our trial, we were actually wanted to test that, where we were actually going to have people, sorry, for the thousand phones we were going to produce, wanted to test that, where we have people coming to one central location to fix the phone. Um, if there's a phone malfunction, the factory actually just stops out the phone. So you just need to say, did your phone malfunction by itself? Yes, it did. That's fine. Bring it. We'll get you, and we'll just give you a new one. And that's fully refundable. It's The repair piece is really around screen damage and... Um, you know, other type of water damage is a more common one. Okay, cool. My, okay. my question was very much on a line with Zach's. Everyone in Africa knows the, the 3310 Nokia and, and how that thing was bulletproof. So <laughs> essentially, <I think laughs> this is, is a key thing. You a fisherman in, in, in basically um, Ghana would drop it in, in the sea and then basically put it in rice and then it's good to go. So that's one thing. Make sure that it's tough. Um, I've got some connections on the on the advertising front that can help you just with regards, um, yeah, just pricing it correctly and 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 looking at how you can maximize that. Um, but obviously, yeah, I think yeah, you've made a good start. I think my one question is, if you were to pick one revenue stream, like you've obviously mentioned, obviously taking a cut of the subscription, data, advertising, what would that be? Data. And, but that's an anomaly for South Africa, um, but definitely data. And the reason why is it's um, firstly the cash flows. It's very clear. It's quick. I can take out the ads because they are a little bit intrusive, to be being honest. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's the top one for us. But the second one, which is also really, really key, um, is uh, those video tutorials. If people, customers are willing to pay, because those are a little bit more variable, but if people really see the value in what we're doing, those can be a game changer as well. We actually, some of our early tests on data, I, so my, my revenue numbers, sorry, just to be clear, reflect uh, an average for the markets that we want to operate. So South Africa, this number on data is dumb. And that's just because we're an anomaly in the, our data costs. Um, but, but really, the, the, the one, the second revenue stream that, is, that works the best would be video ads and the onboarding. Cool. Awesome. So, so there are a couple of comments for, uh, related to that. I think uh, Raj Kulasingham um, asked the question or made the comment about selling insurance on the phone, um, uh, whether that's um, you know, personal insurance or otherwise. Uh, have you looked at that? And second, um, there's a question on uh, interested in the potential impacts of the phone of financial literacy and access to financial products and services from uh, Runya Rao. Uh, Nyandoro. Um, so have you thought about uh, any of those two? We have. We, we were very scared of, so you, the common thread for us is that for every dollar that you price your phone up, you lose a couple of million customers. And that's because of just how price sensitive we are. 
Um, but definitely, it's not it, it's not something we're going to rule out, like charging an insurance fee to say your phone's eleven dollars, but your insurance fee is another two dollars or three dollars. That guarantees you this type of protection. Um, that's definitely an option. I was actually thinking more on the insurance, selling insurance to the phone. I, I don't know which one you meant, oh. Raj, but uh, right. So sh selling uh, individual. I, 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 meant, I meant both. I meant both actually. So you okay. know, if, oh, if you're okay. concerned about if you're concerned about maintenance you could actually assure people that maintenance is covered by the insurance, right? Okay. Uh, well, or funeral. Yeah. Okay. As you know, this is South Africa. <laughs> yeah. Very good. All right. Uh, any final comments or questions? Uh, otherwise, we'll go to uh, what the angels think about Quilly. Can I stop sharing? Okay. Yes, please, if you like. Or maybe you can go to your ask slide. and that Maybe that would be... Uh, that'll be good. So, uh, Hannah, Zach, Will, what do you think? Something you would invest in? You can pull out your checkbook today? <laughs> yeah. I think it's, it's one of those ones where essentially you've got to look at the segment in the market that you're doing. You, obviously, the 40 phones tells you a story, but, but you need to kind of scale that to get a better sense of, of the, the metrics because it is a case of looking at the, the step one first, you know? Yeah, I mean, my thoughts are, I think once you guys have a contract with any m and even if it's a small m and I, I would even say, go talk to the guys at Rain right? Because they've got the lowest data cost, right? They are struggling a bit right now. So this could actually be a good time to talk to them. Um, and you, once you get that initial POC proof of concept locked in or a pilot with them, then this suddenly becomes a more attractive deal from an investment standpoint, right? So I think this has legs. I've seen a few companies that have tried selling very low cost smartphones. Um, and once you have local advertisers signing up, I think this is something that I will take a second look at. But I want to help you first get into some of the MNOs uh, and MTN being top of top of mind. Um, yeah, that would be sort of my my thoughts. So oh, Anna here. Um, I completely echo Zach's comment. I think you've done an incredibly incredible work. Um, and subject to uh, your team demonstrating, uh, you know, a bit of traction. Uh, and I think it's always important to remind entrepreneurs that you need to focus on building a business, having, you know, tangible agreements, uh, both when it comes to MNOs, uh, you know, advertisers. Uh, I can also introduce you to financial uh, literacy, uh, you know, ventures who are trying to, you know, access uh, the type of customers you are targeting. So subject to that, subject to, um, I think maybe the pricing of your hardware, because I do believe that $10 is a bit, uh, is a bit underpriced, so that we can always discuss and make sure that uh, the Chinese kind of route is uh, clarified. Um, and um, yeah, subject to a last review of the competitive, the actual competitive landscape and understanding why some people have failed when it comes to a cheap phone uh, and what is your unique, you know, selling proposition, I would be more than keen to, to be on board. But even until now, I think you've done an incredible job and uh, it's very promising and we need more entrepreneurs like you uh, thinking about local uh, African solutions. Uh, so uh, congratulations. Great, thank you, Hannah. Yeah, I concur. I think it's it's um, any way in which I can help with specifically with making those introductions, but and even just on the pricing on the advertising side. But uh, you know, we need more entrepreneurs, and and you guys are doing a good job. Thanks. Great. Uh, we also had a poll with the audience. Uh, maybe we can uh, show the poll uh, for the audience. And I just want to make a comment. I mean, I think there's some threads in, in some of the comments from the angels as well. I think the pathway to scale is quite important here in the sense that you're not going to be successful until you have quite a bit of scale. So whether that's having the signed contracts with MNO uh, or other partners to ensure that you can reach that scale before you run out of money, I think that's going to be pretty critical. So showing the traction, having some of those uh, partnerships in place so that you have a more credible route to scale, I think is very important. So uh, the, the poll, 
we have quite an interesting mix here. So we have a number of people who thought very highly of uh, your and, and willing to invest over a hundred thousand, uh, quite a few in the middle as well. So uh, congratulations, uh, great results uh, on that poll. Thank you very much for presenting. And uh, clearly we'll, if needed, we'll put you in touch with anybody on this list uh, on the Please call do. and uh, also with the angels involved here. Thanks very much for staying on time and for presenting on the nest. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks Thank everyone. You. Appreciate it. Guys. Excellent. Yes. Great. So now over to uh, Tahir uh, from Mark One. Are you ready to present on your side? Thanks. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Cool. Uh, thank you, German team, for the opportunity to tell our story. At Mark One, we're all about helping retailers make more money. So, what's the problem? Fast food and quick service restaurant chains are facing big challenges to survive. Frontline staff are generally low skilled. Their business model is massively under threat you know, due to this external environment we're currently in. And delivery apps are eating into their profits and are owning their customer data. But this isn't just due to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, this has been coming on for some time. The in-store technology that they have been sold is archaic and really fails to adapt to the changes in their business requirements and their customer behaviors. And this is where Mark One comes in. We are the digital partner that helps retailers make more money. We have built some advanced tech that incorporates, amongst other things, machine learning, cloud computing, and being IoT enabled. But the real value is not in the tech that we have built but rather the business outcomes that we have helped realize. Examples of some of these outcomes include gamifying upsell through our recommendation engine. We help reward cashiers for closing these up the upsell deals in real time. Another one is through using our IoT capability where we are able to entice passerby customers with personalized location triggered SMSs. We are enabling fast food retailers with the ability to elevate their point of sale interactions uh, at scale with technology that's previously only available to the top tier global players. But we've also built it with Africa in mind. Our solution is bulletproof. It has survived the unique challenges that come with operating in Africa and can maintain all its core functionality with weeks, uh, I mean, four weeks, you know, without needing a stable internet connection. So what makes us unique? when there are thousands, if not millions, of point-of-sale companies out there. Well, it is in a way related to the seemingly out-of-context picture of a puppy. We believe that training an organization is like training a puppy. Many of you would know the experience of getting a puppy potty trained. If the puppy were to pee on the carpet and you punish them a week later, they won't be able to attribute that action to the consequence, and therefore there would be no change in behavior. This abstract analogy can be likened to the relationship between a franchisee and a franchisor. If daily activities are only accounted for at month end, it's very difficult you know, to tie these connections between certain activities and their business results. Without the underlying measurement systems in place and given the distance in both time and space from the daily activities, it's almost impossible to determine which sets of activities are driving you know, what business results. Essentially what you need is real-time feedback, and that's what Mark One is. Don't think of us as a point-of-sale provider. We are a real-time feedback mechanism that drives better financial results for retailing businesses. We have a tiered business model approach and meet the business where, where, where it is at. We look at where they are in terms of the operating maturity. Initially, we establish a baseline and then build up a rich data picture. Our business is in a unique position and we benchmark current performance and capabilities with regards to people and technology processes to see what levers we can pull in order to enhance the business outcomes. We then initiate our land and expand strategy. We land with the product and the core technology and then we expand the value we capture by expanding the value we create. Established in 2018, we have in a short space of time 
achieve product market fit and have built a sustainable EBITDA positive entity with exciting financial metrics. We have 0% customer churn and we have reduction in units. It has mostly been positive as we've been able to assist in decision making around closing poor performing locations and even franchisees. We have also established an award-winning brand and are supported by some of the leading players within our space. We are products of A to D24 and are proud to be, have been part of the fifth cohort of the Grindstone Accelerator. Our vision is to be the go-to digital partner for fast food and quick service franchise chains across Africa. The market opportunity is big and exciting and we would like to build on our existing presence in South Africa and Botswana. We are initially focusing on fast food, but continue to build capability to grow horizontally within retail. We are looking to raise just over a million dollars to install 10,000 units by 2025. To execute this, we need to invest in validating our go-to-market approach and developing our sales narrative. Once we have established this predictable go-to-market outcomes, we will then invest in scaling up the sales team, further develop the product offering, and establish a standalone team to grow, build, and run Mark 1. So what is our ask of the nest? Well, we're currently doing a Series A capital raise, uh, but we sort of find ourselves in between the seed and the Series A. Um, so we're looking sort of for pre-Series A funding to validate our go-to-market approach. In addition to this, our soft ask is around introduction to potential investors, as well as network access to franchisors or national retailers. Again, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I'm Tyre and I run Mark One. Thank you very much, great presentation. All right, over to the angels. Right, could um, you mind? No, Hannah, go ahead, ladies first. No, please uh, go. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about the functionalities of your POS? If we go back to the slide where you were talking about machine learning and IoT and upsell engine. So what does your device exactly do? Yeah. Yes. yeah. So, so the first thing is we have the point of sale terminal. So we're actually capturing the transactions within a retail store. Part of our platform is we have an IoT device in the store as well. And this device can track smartphones. So we are tracking smartphone users in and around the store. You know, so effectively, we can say how many people came past your store, how many people came into your store, when they came into your store, how long did they stay, and how often do they come back? You know, so we have quite a lot of detailed sort of analytics around customer behavior. We then link this up with transactional behavior, as well as temperature and day of the week and time of the day. We put this into a machine learning engine, which then forecasts what you're going to sell and at what time of the day. You know, so say when eight times a day we are running this the machine learning engine and we are telling the in-store staff, you need to prepare these items because we're gonna sell these items today. You know, make sure you have the stock Make sure you have the, the right number of people in the kitchen. Make sure you have the right number of people in the till. You know, so all of this kind of information we are processing all of the time. Um, when it comes to our recommendation engine, so as somebody comes into the store, they'll ask for a pie, you know, and that will be the end of the transaction. What we then do is we prompt the cashier with upsell opportunities, you know. So we'll say on the screen, don't you want to offer a drink? The customer may be thirsty. Now, if the cashier closes that upsell deal, we reward them and we give them a score. Now we can start rating all cashiers within that franchise chain against each other. We can see who's the best, who's the worst. We create World Cups, you know, every week, who's the top upselling agent. Um, and we start to incentivize their performance in that way. I mean, the other thing is we give them their performance in real time. So on the screen itself, they will know what the average basket size is. They will know what the upsell score is. They'll know what they're doing versus their targets, you know? And so it's like watching a football match, you know? If you don't know the score, it's not gonna be that exciting. 
they know all the score all of the time and they continuously push um, to up their metrics. Yeah. Great, thank you. And very last comment bef um, for, for now, but I think um, your, your presentation was interesting, but you can see that at the end of the presentation, it was not very clear uh, what your device was doing, which is quite unfortunate. And I think that, um, yeah, you should just focus on, you know, a data-driven presentation. Uh, you have more, uh, more than enough to, to, to discuss and, you know, spending a lot of time on, on a puppy picture when you only have five minutes to present is a bit uh, risky. So depending on the type of investors, you know, it might be a bit risky. But now very clear about your, your device and thank you very much for that. But I'll just say, I, I thought the puppy was very cute, so. <laughs> It just, it just See? <laughs> Depends on the investor. <laughs> um, so I've got a, um, I've got a few questions. Um, um, first of all, uh, I don't think you spend a lot of time explaining what your revenue model is. Is it just, uh, are you just charging for use of the POS system? Is it, is, it, is it a SaaS model, pretty much? Is there a subscription component to it? Is there a per transaction component to it? Just a little bit more on the revenue model. Uh, and just a little um, tip for the future, showing a chart like this in a presentation is an eyesore. So, I mean, <laughs> there's no way anyone can read this chart. So it's gonna be very clear. Yeah. SaaS, transactions, FX, whatever the case may be. So yes. this, yeah. You tune me off. So just a quick on that. What's your revenue model? Okay. How you money? Yeah, so so a lot of our revenue comes from a monthly subscription model. So okay. we sign contracts, you know, four years in length, where yep. we get payments yep. every month. And this is effectively for the hardware, software, and the cloud console platforms, okay. right? Okay. Once we now, you know yeah. yeah. No, go okay. ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to so, say, so, so, so that's, that's a fixed model. So how are you, yeah. I mean, I, I love the gamification um, mm -hmm. aspect of the business, but how are you, are you, are you getting a percentage of upsell as a company in addition to your subscription model or? Yeah, so at the moment we don't, uh, it really depends on the maturity of the business. You know, so our first sort of step in is in ensuring we have that baseline in place. You know, so yeah. we get the, the hardware, software, all of these kinds of things. Then we come yeah. with our value added services. You know, so yeah. here's the push notification to pass yeah. it by customers. So we're charging, you know, per transaction, you know, whenever somebody actually gets the SMS, you know, we are charging for that. Um, yeah. We have uh, sort of these automated TV screens that change the ads whenever a certain foot traffic number is coming up. You know, so these are, our value added services that we build now on top of our core platform. Um, do, you guys, do you mind if I ask you a, a small technical question? Do you guys use yeah. Beacon technology at all? Yes, so we, we actually, uh, I mean, use a, a very specific access point that tracks smartphone Wi-Fi. you know? So uh, effectively we, we pick up Wi-Fi Mac address, Wi-Fi signal strength and Wi-Fi manufacturer. You know, yeah. so using these three data points, we then triangulate and create unique identities. Um, and this is where we're getting our sort of customer behavioral analytics elements from. And that's, uh, and that's Poppy compliant, yeah? Yeah. So um, before you have actually signed up with us, you know, we don't know that it's you and it's a completely hashed version of you. As soon as you sign into a Wi-Fi network that we create, you know, we then go through an acceptance of our terms um, and then we actually know it's you and then we can offer this personalized push notification experience. So, the, so, so just to be clear, that is the Mark 1 Wi-Fi network, not the, re, it's not Burger King's Wi-Fi network, it's Mark 1 Wi-Fi network. But, yeah, so we the, take, yeah, we take over that network. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. And can you just quickly go to your, the, the, the penultimate slide, your traction? I just want to ask you a couple of questions on that. Uh, the one, literally the penultimate slide. The very last slide before thank you. One more, one more. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that one, okay. Um, so you're saying, uh, how old are you guys? Two years, three years? Yeah, about 30 months, yeah. So coming on to three years now. And yeah. you've got... And then you've got positive EBITDA. I mean, usually, yeah. 
people, I mean, uh, I'm an angel investor and an early stage VC. So I, I, I'm surprised when companies have positive EBITDA. My question to you is a funny one. Why isn't your EBITDA negative? And what I mean by that is, are you not scaling fast enough? Yeah, look, um, I mean, this is something that's come up. I'm an operations guy and we have a lot of engineers within the team. So we've optimized the hell out of our operation, you know? So I have one technician that effectively covers 1,000 tools. You know, I have one contact center agent that covers 1,500 stores, you know? So in terms of optimizing our operational performance, this is what we are great at, you know, yeah. we we still struggling is, you know, on building out our sales narrative and our go-to-market approach, Got you it. know, and, and that's where you, you could say we should invest more, but we want to invest in the right kind of way um, with the right kind of partners. I mean, these margins are very, very impressive. Anything in this yeah. space, a margin above 40% is, is extremely good. And you've got a 68% margin. I'm actually surprised at how high those margins are. Um, yeah, quick, just where yeah. my side there, Zach, can I just go in there? Yeah, yeah, please, please. Sure, sure, sure. Just, just with regards, I think a comment for me is, is obviously we've seen what's happening in the US with Dash, um, Dash uh, Hub and, and how obviously food retailers aren't really making much from this. So I think what I like is obviously it's it's providing more data back to the, 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 the retailers and franchises. And then just, just on that baseline you mentioned, how do you calculate that baseline? You mentioned that, yeah. you, you know, you, what metrics do you use to establish that baseline? Yeah, so once we go into a company, you know, we, we put down our, our platform and now we're starting to pull out a lot of interesting metrics, you know, so we can capture what is your conversion rate of passer by customers, you know, by location, by time of the day, we can now benchmark you against, uh, you know, similar companies. We also look at, you know, what is your upsell current capability? Yeah, you know, so, so we've got, you know, all of these units now across South Africa. We know what the performance is like. We've got, you know, 30 months worth of data. You know, in the same way, we're looking at upsell, you know, how much are you closing upsell deals? We're looking at your store opening times, you know. So in the past, you have a mall that opens at 9 a.m. We know that there's food traffic outside your, your store, but you haven't sold anything, you know. So we're sending alerts to actually notify the, the, the staff to say what's going on. You know, so we're using a lot of these metrics. We, we really understand the basics, you know, and we can quickly benchmark new locations, new stores versus these ben, um, benchmarks and see where the big opportunities are. Um, have, you, have you sold to any major franchises like um, famous brands or any of the other big brands in South Africa, or is it mostly mom and pop retailers? I mean, you said it's pre it's predominantly fast food, right? What's yeah. Look, I mean, our our biggest client is Pi City. You know, so oh, yeah. we are in all Pi cities, you know, across South Africa and Botswana as well. So they they're actually the ones that took us out. Um, and look, our 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 main target is actually multi-store retailers. Um, you get the most out of our system when you have to manage stores that are across a wide space, you know? So our, our solution is not totally ideal for a single installation. You know, we, we're looking generally from 20 stores to like 500 stores. And we don't have, let's say in a famous brand, so we haven't really connected with them yet, but they would definitely be on our, our target list. And from a pricing standpoint, you are, I mean, how much, how much lower are you compared to Gap, Micros, Pilot, and some of the brick and mortar ones? That's the first question. Second question yeah. is, do you see Yoko as a mobile POS as a competitor or not? Or are they predominantly smaller merchants? Yeah, so I think uh, on the Yoko one, you know, it's more for single installations. So, I mean, I've, I've had a lot of chats with the Yoko guys, um, even about collaboration, et cetera. Um, yeah. We're looking for more multi-store, you know, installations, and 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 they definitely, again, for single store uh, iterations. With regards to Garp, Micros, etc., because our our platform is so scalable, we can run it at, at a much lower cost than them. You know, so generally we come in at about half of mm -hmm. their price, 
you know, and uh, we, we can use that as a, a marketing tool effectively. We can offer the solution for free for six months, 12 months, you know, especially in these kind of COVID times when everybody's, you know, uh, trying to save a buck. Um, so, so yeah, we, we generally are about 50% of that price um, and we're still able to, you know, make a significant margin. So what are you about 50 to $60 per merchant per month? Uh, yeah, per, per tool. Yeah, that's per tool, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And there's a related question. So how do you handle restaurant chains uh, with existing POS systems? Uh, obviously, there needs to be a swap out. So how, how has that uh, sales process been? Yeah, so I mean, what we actually, process. yeah, um, I mean, again, we don't want to have a discussion about point of sale. You know, we, we want to build the business case for the money that they're losing. You know, so we, our initial engagement, we're not even talking about hardware or software. We say, let's see your metrics. Let's see how much money you're making. Let's see your conversion and all of these things. And then let's say, if we tweak certain factors, you know, how much will that impact your bottom line? You know, and then we say, okay, well, you can see now if you increase upsell by 20%, this is the impact on bottom line. If you increase opening times, it's, you know, these impacts. Now we're saying, we will do that for you, you know? And, and that's kind of how we convince the change to switch over. And generally what happens is we get like five stores and uh, they say, now prove it to us. And once we get five stores, we kind of, we're in and we can just take it from there. Um, is there any other industry in which you think your technology is applicable um, outside dining restaurants in QSR? Yeah. Where do you see your business yeah. going? So, so, I mean, our biggest, um, let's say, benefit or value is an impulse buy. You know, so if we can influence that impulse buying moment, that's where our technology works best. You know, so I, I almost like compare it sometimes with like a, like a Woolworths versus an accessorize, you know, you can buy similar items at the mm -hmm. two stores, but if you go to Woolworths, you stand in the queue, you come to the till, they're not gonna say to you, oh, there's some shoes, they go back and bring the shoes because it matches your belt. You know, that there's not an impulse buy. And accessorize, you come there with the earrings and they'll say, well, we've got the, the chain or, you know, and, and you can quickly add and, and using data, you know, similar to what you see at like Take a Lot, we can start adding and recommending items that make sense. You know, so impulse buy is definitely where we- So Richard to Scott to. Martin um, uh, commented, convenience stores at garages with large product SKUs and multiple promotions going on, for example. Yeah, right. exactly. In, in the impulse buy space, you know, that's kind of where we fit in and quite well. Given that right now you're focusing on the dining sort of industry, so how, how is your investment thesis impacted by COVID? Because obviously we can expect in the long term any, maybe an adjustment in the customer behavior, but right now very few people are just walking around, um, you know, like, so have you seen an impact on your numbers in the past two or three months or how, how is it going? Uh, so I think it's two things, right? So number one is, most of our clients have been closed for the last two months and they've only really started up now. Um, so, so that's been, let's say a challenge, but we've, we've worked our way through that. The second thing is they see us as core to coming out of this, you know? So one of the primary factors that they're looking at is, is foot traffic, you know? So that we have data on foot traffic and conversion rate. So now when is the foot traffic going to hit a certain number when they should decide, should I open my store or not? You know, the second thing is they also realize that they can't keep all of these stores open anymore. You know, these mm -hmm. stores that will have to close. Now, which store should you close? What metrics are you using to inform that decision? And, you know, it was one of our clients closed five stores um, about two weeks ago and they made a decision in two days because they already knew all the underlying metrics and said, this is the store that needs to go. You know, so we are informing the decisions even in, in tough times. So I have a question on the on more on the investment side. Uh, so echoing Zach's previous uh, sentiment, I mean you're, you've got a decent amount of revenue, or certainly revenue and traction, uh, and you know your 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 burn rate isn't too high. Uh, why not go for a larger round? Why don't we go for a proper series, a larger proper a series A round? 
Yes, yeah, so, I mean, we've started some of the discussions with South African VCs, you know, and um, the feedback that we've been getting is like, we want to see more, you know, we want to see more traction, we want to see more in the market. You only have, let's say, 4 million rand revenue, you know, and you're asking for 20 million rand, that like, we, we, we have in this discussion. Um, so it's almost like we, we, we're in a stuck between this like, post seed pre seed is a kind of position uh, they don't want to give us 20 but you know we don't want to take 2 million you know so it, it's been a interesting space that we're currently in so what uh, are you looking to raise when you do raise the round and you know, what uh, valuation cap yeah so um, i mean we've done a few valuation models we're looking at you know 20 million uh, for 20% you know that's sort of our ingoing uh, kind of offer Okay. Yeah. Can we just... so this is Rand, sorry. <laughs> so <laughs> 1.165 million dollars. Can we talk a little bit about the team? Sorry if I missed that part of the presentation. Uh, but who are the key yeah. people in your team? How did you meet? Um, and... yeah. so, so I'm the CEO. Um, we have, let's say, three other co-founders. Uh, so Mohamed Simji. Um, I worked with him during management consulting days, I don't know, five years ago now. Um, and I've been sort of working with him over the years. He's the founder of a company called A2D24. And Mark One has actually been spawned out of A2D24. Um, the other sort of founders within that team, it's uh, AQ Amra, who looks after all of our actually product and product development. Uh, MTS Majera was our head of development. Uh, and then Sophia Dachrat looks after all our internal operations. Um, now, currently, we are sharing some of these resources between A to D24 and Mark One, and this is kind of where I talk about creating the standalone entity. You know, that really is going to. Yes, I saw that in uh, in your presentation, so I was a bit intrigued because you talked about a separate entity was created like one year after you started operation. Yeah. So, so the product itself was, you know, started towards the end of 2017. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, it, and it was just a product of ATD24. And ATD24 is a product development house. Uh, yeah. we, we build, you know, health tech, fintech, retail tech, and, you know, products. Um, and then sort of in 2018 and in 2019, we said, okay, there's something big that we may have here with Mark One. And let's actually try to scale this business. Um, and that's when I sort of got seconded into Mark One and now I'm fully allocated, you know, to, to scaling up this, this company. Thank you. Uh, and and if, if, if it's okay with me asking this, I mean, you're, you're looking to raise 20 million Rand. Do you, do you have a lead South African VC already in? So we, we don't have a lead just yet. I mean, we've been chatting to, to three VCs at the moment. Um, and we, we're starting to unpack the business model and the financials and these things. Um, ideally, we would like one lead, but we, we haven't got any firm commitment yet. And you're saying the valuation in RAND terms is about 80 to 90 million RAND? Yeah. Okay, got it. And this is your first round outside of the founders funding this? Yeah. Okay, and for the nest coming in, you're looking at a 20% discount to the Series A. Yeah. Got it, okay. Okay, cool. Sure. Just, okay, so. All right, well, um, perhaps we can put up a poll and then maybe go to the angels and see what they think about ne next steps with Mark One. Will, Zach, Hannah? Yeah, I'll go first. Um, I so I've 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 known about Mark One for a while. Um, I had no idea that you'd already broken even. That was news to me. Um, so that's a positive. I I would like to figure you know fi fi figure out in a long story short. I'm 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 really interested. Uh, I'd be keen to chat to you and your team offline about terms to see how you go from 258 units to 2000 units 
um, and your cost of acquiring customers needs to work through a large brand. That's why I mentioned famous brands as an example. Yeah. Um, I also want to know what your strategy is outside South Africa because this has a lot of legs. So long story short, definitely the fund that I'm uh, Launch Africa, which uh, will be going live very soon in the next couple of months, we would definitely be interested. Um, so we'll chat with the other VCs you're working with. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very keen to, uh, to, like a, to take a look at this. No, thanks. I mean, just um, on that, you know, African expansion, um, we've actually partnered with ABSA Africa, you know, so now that they've sort of come out of the Sparkly's arrangement, they want to do kind of value added services. Uh, and we're starting a pilot with them within our Botswana kind of space. We will yeah. be going into uh, 15 retailers over the next six months, you know, to prove the concept there. I can also help you big time in Botswana. I've got a really good network of uh, SME small businesses in Botswana that would love this idea. Uh, Choppies, Choppies could look at this. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a lot of legs. I'm really impressed. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. So on my side, I think um, I would need to, to get uh, a bit more comfortable regarding uh, some of the figures that have been presented, including, um, I think, the sustainability of the margins. Uh, because I think you, you guys are still sharing some resources with another business so on a standalone basis. Uh, it would be good to do a, a little bit more um, financial DD. Um, I think that at this stage also, I'm not too sure about the, the size of the market and the opportunity. So for instance, your target is to sell 10, uh, I think 10,000 units. Uh, you mentioned this number uh, within- uh, five, years. I, five years. Five years, I'm not sure if it's too low, too big. And I think uh, the presentation was not given uh, giving any indication regarding the size of the market. So maybe you can do a bit more uh, work on that. Um, and also it feels like the, profile of your customers, uh, like, you know, dining and QSA and restaurants and this kind of customers are quite risky from my perspective right now, uh, given the market conditions. So uh, it would be a bit, uh, a, bit, uh, a bit challenging. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, just, just from my side, uh, just disclosure, obviously Mark One is, is a grindstone company. So I do know to hear, I didn't realize he was selected. So well done to hear. Um, yeah, I think we, we obviously have also assisting to hear where, where, where necessary. So on, on the funding side, so, but well done. Great. Well, with that, maybe we can see the results of the poll. Let's see the results of the poll. What, what does the audience think? So uh, we have quite a, uh, a good result here uh, with a number of people uh, looking at um, a more than $100,000 investment, uh, over almost a third. So congratulations on a nice presentation and a great concept. And I, I would say from, from Untapped's perspective, just to give you an idea, so at Untapped, we provide asset financing for um, really productive assets, uh, productive assets for SMBs. And I think uh, we should have a conversation about whether this fits what we're trying to finance as well. So perhaps we can provide some CapEx financing for scaling up, uh, especially if you have a contract in hand with a, with a, with a big customer. Definitely. So let's stay in touch about that. Thanks, Joe. All right. Thank well, thank you very much, everybody, for the presentation and for the angel uh, comments and questions and for the participation from the audience. Uh, thank you, uh, presenters, for taking the time to present. And um, congratulations on, on, on great presentations. I look forward to seeing you guys next week. And I just want to shout out to entrepreneurs. If you want to apply, uh, please uh, feel free to apply via our website, findthenest.org. It's a very simple process. You send a 30 to 60 seconds uh, message to a WhatsApp number, and, um, and then we'll evaluate your company. And if you're an investor or an accelerator, we'd love to hear from you as well. We'd like to do more partnerships and do more nests with local groups. Um, such
special ones we're doing with uh, Nairobi Garage and Prince. So on that note, thank you very much for everyone's time. We will hopefully see you next week. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye. 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 Thanks, Hannah. Great to Thanks have you for the invitation. It was a great uh, honor and pleasure. Cheers, everyone.